Hi there, and welcome to the Alberta Update, a look at what's happening in your province. I am your host, Bruce McAllister. Thank you for being with us, as always. Coming up on the program today, the Premier is going to drop by. We're going to talk about the uh, the Navigation Centre in Edmonton, some uh, great news coming out of Edmonton, and uh, pushing back against Ottawa, that and more with the Premier. Education Minister Demetrius Nicolaitis will be along. We will chat with him about new schools and the new social studies curriculum and transportation and economic corridors. Minister Devin Dreeshen is here to chat about a big announcement as well this week. All that and more over the next few minutes as we look at what's happening in your province. First, we welcome in the Premier to uh, to chat with uh, the Premier about several things. Premier, you've had a busy week, so we're going to talk about probably five different things. Uh, let's start with the Navigation Centre. Look, Edmonton looks a lot different than it did three months ago. You, you gave police uh, the powers, the resources they need to take down some of those encampments. The Navigation Centre has been a huge success. Can you tell us how big of a success and what you announced this week? You know, it's pretty remarkable because when I first got back into office again, I, I asked for, uh, I was, I have a, a protection unit. And I said, well, show me where all of the encampments are. And we drove around Edmonton and it was just heartbreaking to see what has happened in our capital city in the, in the intervening years. I think a lot, it became pretty bad during the, the pandemic and it was just getting worse. And so I resolved then that we, we had to clear the encampments. We had to get people help. And we have to make sure that they don't come back because that is is no way for a person to live. We want to make sure that they're supported if they've got mental health and addiction, if they've got health needs. So the Navigation Centre got established in mid-January. So we're, we're just over two months in. And I did this similar tour earlier this week. And instead of having 700 tent cities, we're now down to 28 encampments. Mm -hmm. That gives you some idea of just the remarkable success. And the fact of the matter is that we've also... Um, connected 700 people to a variety of services, 2,200 different services, because a lot of people have high needs and need to be in a number of different, uh, have a number of different supports. And we're just setting people back on the road to recovery, connecting them with family, connecting them with jobs, connecting them with housing, connecting them with addiction treatment. It's changing lives, and I couldn't be more proud of the, the team that was behind this, Dan Williams with Mental Health and Addiction, Jason Nixon with Seniors Community and Social Services, and of course, Mike Ellis, our, our Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Services. Premier, will we see this program expand? Calgary, other centres maybe? Sure hope so. Um, we want to have our next expansion be in Calgary. We have to work with them to find the appropriate place for it because it is, it is complicated because you have to have a lot of services in one spot. Um, and any other community that is seeing a very high level of individuals who need this kind of help, we want to either put up a navigation centre so we can do that work or work with a social agency in those communities who are already doing that connection function. You know, I might just say, Bruce, one of the things we were asked in a, a press conference this week, someone asked if these services were redundant. And I just thought, wow, what a different experience a person has versus the way it has been done in the past, where if you need to have addiction support, you have to go through one door. And if you need your ID, you have to go through another. And then if you need income support, you have to go through another. And if you need shelter, you have to go through another. You could end up going to six or seven different spaces. So no wonder it's been difficult for people to navigate to the level of care that they need. Having everything in one spot just makes it so much easier. And that's why I think we're going to have so much more success. Uh, listen, you, you had another announcement this week. We had a lot. Let's do the seniors next uh, with, with Minister of Service Alberta and Red Tape Reduction, Dale Nally. Um, some inflationary, uh, some help to, for seniors with the inflationary crisis and times that we're seeing. What was announced and why? Well, we uh, campaigned during the last election on giving a 25% seniors discounts on the registry services that they need. Because when you think about it, um, whether it's a birth certificate, a death certificate, um, or uh, having to get additional driver testing, when you're on a fixed income, all of those things cost extra money. And so if you're able to reduce that cost by even 25%, it'll make a, a big difference, I think, to, to the bottom line for a lot of the seniors. So we, we've just gotten started. There may be other services that we're able to add, but we, we wanna make sure that people know that, uh, that that's gonna be available to anyone who's helped to build this province, anyone over the age of 65. I know, uh, I know a lot of seniors that are very happy about it. Uh, Premier, you, you wrote a letter to the Prime Minister earlier this week. This is a two-part question. You were asking him uh, for an increase to Alberta's provincial nominee program allocation. So can you expand on why you've done that? And we also know uh, that Alberta has seen a large number of Ukrainian evacuees, of course, in the last year and a half or so. Uh, can you provide us an update uh, on where that is at and supports for the Ukrainians coming here? Well, Alberta 
is the place to be, whether you're from another province or whether you're from around the world or whether you're facing and fleeing hardship as uh, Ukrainian ev evacuees are. We, we have about 12% of the Canadian population, but now we're getting about 25% of newcomers are coming to our province because there's so much opportunity here. And with the Ukrainian population in particular, we have such a large uh, diaspora of Ukrainian citizens that settled here over the past number of decades that are able to offer a level of support that I think it may not be a, a available in other jurisdictions. So we have used a program, which is a pathway to permanent residency, permanent um, immigration. And we had asked the federal government if they would increase our numbers. We, we've had slow increases over the years, being able to have 10,000 people come through that program. We, we need 20,000 to be able to go through that program. So far, over 57,000 Ukrainians have come to Alberta in the last two years, and more are going to come with the, the visa expiry happening at the federal level. So we just feel like this allows for us to be as welcoming as I, I know that Albertans can be and wish to be, but also give a pathway so that people can get connected with the with a job and with the, with an incredible future in this beautiful province. And so they have, instead of increasing our number of provincial nominees, they actually decreased it this year, which is unacceptable. If we, As you know, I read the Constitution a lot. My read of Section 95 of the Constitution is that immigration is concurrent responsibility, meaning we have equal rights to be able to make sure that we're offering that that welcoming reception to those newcomers who are coming to our country. And we're going to, to fight to make sure that we get the number of nominees that we need to be able to, to, to match the needs of our economy with the people who want to arrive here. All right. Uh, just seems to make sense, doesn't it? Hey, you were in NISCU this week for an announcement on hydrogen. Uh, what can you tell us uh, about that? One of my favorite topics. I love hydrogen. When I <laughs> when I first I read this book called Smelling Land, and it first gave me I don't know why it's called that. It's a, it's a strange title for a book. I know I'm going to have to tell you what it is next time I talk to you. But it talked about the potential for hydrogen, and I've been thinking about it for for years since. I thought it was going to be many decades into the future, and yet there are other countries around the world that have had breakthroughs in using hydrogen for to, to fuel passenger vehicles, uh, Toyota Mirais, there's also Hyundai vehicles and various others. And so what was exciting about, about uh, the announcement this week is that the very first privately owned and operated hydrogen fueling station has set up just south of Edmonton in, in Leduc County. And it, I hope it is the first of many because you need to build the infrastructure in order to give people the confidence that they can switch over to a, a zero emissions hydrogen vehicle. So I, I hope people are starting to think about that. There's a, a 5,000 car challenge that Edmonton has put out there. I think that uh, Calgary should try to match them. And that should be where the next fueling station is, is kind of in that Calgary area. But I think all of our mid-sized cities, if we can find a location in Fort McMurray, Grand Prairie, over in Cold Lake, in Red Deer, Medicine Hat, Lethbridge, then we can create an entire network where whether you're in a long haul vehicle, a long haul trucking industry, or, or whether you just want to uh, have a zero emissions vehicle fueled by hydrogen and travel all over the province, you'll be able to do so. That's where we want to get to. Excellent. The possibilities are limitless and you know uh, Albertans will lead the way when it comes to uh, being entrepreneurs in this space. Listen, I hate to end on a downer, but I have to. I want to I ask you about Ottawa. Um, we're still, premiers across the country are still pushing back against the carbon tax, um, you know, appearing in Ottawa, but I, I, I get the impression it's falling on deaf ears. Do you want to uh, comment on that before we let you go? Well, look, I mean, uh, we, we there's four premiers who've written letters who all want to appear before committees in Ottawa. And you probably saw with, uh, with Scott Moe and the treatment that he received at committee that, that tells you all you need to know about the, the, the fact that they don't want to hear it, interrupting, calling points of order, delaying proceedings. If, if there was a, a real and genuine interest in hearing about the concerns of Canadians, then then uh, they, they would have asked us a lot earlier and they'd be asking us and, and supportive of us all giving presentations and be respect, respectful when we make our presentations. Because I can tell you, there are some legitimate reasons why you might want to have a, a, a fuel tax. We, we have a 13 cent a liter fuel tax to pay for roads. The federal government has a 10 cent a liter fuel tax, perhaps for the same reason, because they do also invest in roads, although Stephen Gibbo doesn't want to build any anymore. But this 17 cent fuel tax that is now going on, the carbon tax coming in on April the 1st, that's just punitive. Um, on top of that, they charge GST, which is a tax on tax, adding additional cost, um, not to mention the cost on natural gas. Natural gas 
uh, the fuel tax is now double the amount that we're paying for the base price of natural gas fuel. It's, cost, it's increasing the cost of home heating, increasing the cost of transportation. None of that gets rebated to, uh, to the, the small businesses that are, are providing services. All of it gets built into the cost of the products that we pay. So it's inflationary. And so the federal government keeps trying to argue that uh, Albertans are getting rebates. But I can tell you, even the Parliamentary Budget Office says that we are spending $911 million more than the federal government rebates in this tax. People just want to have their own money left in their own pocket. We can solve this problem a different way. We can solve it by reducing industrial emissions. That is my message to Ottawa. That will always be my message to Ottawa. Well, we're lucky you're uh, you're there to give it uh, give it to them for us, Premier. Thanks for this. Listen, have a have a great Easter long weekend, and uh, we'll see you back here in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Bruce. Well, lots happening on the education front in Alberta, and uh, the man tasked with uh, keeping track of it all is, of course, Education Minister Demetrius Nicolaitis. He joins us to talk about what's new on the education front and uh, what's important uh, for Albertans. Uh, Minister, good to see you. As always, thank you for taking the time. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you as well. Let's start with the uh, the curriculum, the social studies curriculum. A lot of work went into uh, drafting a new curriculum. Uh, look, I've been reading some of the feedback you've been getting, and it seems to be, you know, obviously there, there are always a critic or two, but by and large, very positive. What are your thoughts on it and where are we at with it? Yeah, so in terms of where we're at, so we've released the draft um, and we're asking members of the public, any interested Albertan to uh, have a look and provide us with feedback. Uh, and that window to provide feedback will be open until April, sec uh, April 2nd. So a few more days to go here. Once we collect some additional feedback, we can make some revisions. We then hope to start piloting the new curriculum in schools in September of 24, and then make it mandatory in September of 25. So getting a lot of feedback and engagement. Uh, and yeah, and as you noted, I don't think any two Albertans or individuals uh, view the same historical events with uh, significance, uh, the same level of significance or importance. There's lots of di disagreement and different interpretations of history. So I, I totally get it. I recognize that um, people will have different views and opinions about the social studies curriculum. What we were shooting for and what was important for us is to take ideology out of the curriculum, give students an in-depth understanding of history so that they can understand contemporary issues and also ensure that they're sharpening their critical thinking skills. And I believe we've delivered precisely that. Okay, listen, you've answered the second question uh, beautifully, which is ex which to me was, what is the goal? What are you trying to accomplish? So sounds like you're trying to make sure you have the best representation uh, of as much um, pertinent information for these kids as you can, obviously without overdoing it. This is K to six, so is seven to 12 next? Yes, so we have uh, we have released the K to six. We, we have also released a preliminary outline for seven to twelve as well. The, the curriculum isn't developed for that piece, but we have released a draft outline as to what seven to twelve would look like. So so folks could see the co complete progression of the social studies. And kind of just coming back to your question about what we're hoping to achieve. Um, in the early phase, back in October, before we did any of the drafting, we asked Albertans what they wanted to see. 13,000 Albertans responded to our survey. And they said that they wanted to see a, a sharpening of critical thinking skills. They said that they wanted to see a strong foundation in history. And, uh, and I believe we've delivered exactly that by giving students a good understanding of Canadian history and global history. And at the same time, of course, ensuring that students are learning about primary sources, secondary sources, learning about opinions and facts and learning about uh, research processes. Uh, these are all valuable skills that they'll need to be successful. You know, it was funny. I was in a meeting. Uh, uh, Premier was, somebody was explaining to Premier some of the new curriculum. And uh, of course, she's keen, wants to read everything and, and was almost joking. Like she'd like to, she'd like to be taught it all again. You know, it really is interesting what, what you're putting together. Now, all we need, Minister, are the schools to teach these kids in. And you are, are the man on the hot seat for this. Uh, first, some perspective on, uh, I guess, the overall school bit build in Alberta. How many new schools are coming and can you build them fast enough? Yeah, absolutely. In the budget, we have 19 new schools coming across the province. 
uh, and these will uh, will add about 35,000 um, additional spaces uh, to uh, to every corner of our province. Um, in total, we have 98 projects that are in the pipeline. And with Budget 24, we're moving about 43 of these projects forward. Uh, there's different stages that a project needs to go through. Uh, planning, design, where you hire the, the architect and design the project, and then, of course, full construction. So 43 projects are moving forward. 19 are, are have moved into the full construction phase. That's the highest number of full construction projects in seven years. So uh, we are trying to work as aggressively as we can to build new schools because a lot of people are choosing to come to Alberta and this is putting some pressure on our schools, uh, but we are looking to do it as quickly as we possibly can. That's it. Look, um, it's a blessing and a curse. I said many, many times, everybody wants to come to Alberta. We need the infrastructure to keep up. How about our biggest cities, Edmonton and Calgary? Uh, we know how many of the people and uh, Ukrainian um, you, people from Ukraine and other places are coming, coming here, of course. Uh, are you able to keep up there? And what will we see in Calgary and Edmonton? Yeah, so the, the lion's share of the, the, the new school projects, uh, over 80%, will be in the Calgary and Edmonton regions. Uh, so for the Calgary metropolitan area, we'll see about um, 18 new schools in, uh, in the pipeline that we're planning to build. Those 18 new schools uh, will add approximately 16,000 spaces for students in the Calgary metropolitan region. Edmonton, similar about uh, out of the 43 projects that we're moving forward, there's 14 that have been allocated there for Edmonton, which will add approximately 12,000 spaces. So we, we tried to take an evidence-based approach in looking at where are, the, where are the areas of greatest need and demand? Where are we seeing the biggest pressures? No surprise, we're seeing the biggest pressures in our major urban centers. So we've made sure that the new schools that we're going to build uh, accommodate the pressure that we're seeing in those two main regions. Well, you've got uh, a lot on your plate, Minister. We appreciate you taking taking a few minutes to uh, bring us up to speed, of course, and uh, we'll we'll bug you from time to time for an update. Uh, keep up the good work, and thank you. Thank you. Yeah, happy to chat anytime. All right, Minister of Education Demetrius Nicolaitis joining us. In other news, uh, still with education, the University of Alberta and the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology have joined uh, NATO's Defense Innovation Network. Uh, the NATO organization provides comprehensive support to businesses uh, and innovators, offering them training and guidance, as well as access to investors and, uh, and to defense expertise. Um, as test centers, the U of A and SAIT will help entrepreneurs and innovators develop and execute their technology uh, or product designs. Minister of Technology and Innovation, Nate Glubish, now uh, with more. And for Alberta to be selected for the University of Alberta and also for SAIT down in Calgary, uh, to have test centers, this is huge. This is a great opportunity for us as Albertans to participate in next generation research and new technology commercialization that is going to contribute to keeping our country safe and to keep, keeping uh, democratic principles around the world safe. And I am so excited for Alberta to be a part of this. The Premier was in Houston last week. She was marketing our province to investors. We spoke with the Premier about it, of course, on last week's Alberta Update. Many people are still talking about that trip and uh, and the great job that the Premier did highlighting our energy industry uh, to investors and uh, the importance of Alberta being a key player on the international stage. Here are a few highlights from her conversations in Houston. So thank you for joining us for this conversation. I am joined by Honorable Daniel Smith. Any takeaways that you took from uh, yesterday and I guess the morning so far? Well, it's a lot like our Calgary Stampede, but a lot more policy intensive. So I'm thinking maybe we should add some policy sessions during Stampede in between rodeo and chuck wagons. We've got 170 billion barrels of oil that is confirmed reserves. America's right now at 36 billion. So our reserves in Alberta alone are five times America's. We are the largest supplier to America, larger than Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Iraq combined. I'm challenging our, our industry to be able to meet that, that future demand. Well, I look at it as a, 
a transition away from emissions, not a transition away from production and not a transition away from, from usage. So Air Products was one of the first and it is a net zero hydrogen facility. So it will be helping to build out the hydrogen infrastructure so that we can build up transportation infrastructure. Can carbon capture live up to the expectation? And that may be an open question in some jurisdictions, but not Alberta. Alberta has immense pore space. My officials tell me the theoretical amount that we have in, in for sequestration capacity in our pore space would be able to sequester all of the emissions produced by man so far. The risk is the lack of understanding about what transition truly means. Years ago, everybody was asking the question, of, will oil sands ever be something that is a, a marketable product? Well, now it is the bulk of our production. And so that's why I have such confidence in innovation, because I've seen it in action in our province. We can reduce emissions and also provide energy security and also provide energy affordability. We can do all three and we can do it better than anyone else. We're right here. We are your best friend, your best neighbor. We already have a pipeline infrastructure. We have businesses that are doing business cross-border in both. We are already your, your biggest supplier. Why would you look anywhere else when you could look to Alberta? Alberta is investing in roads, in bridges, and driver training programs to keep Albertans safe and to, to help move us into the future and uh, be on the cutting edge of the infrastructure that is required in this province. Minister of Transportation and Economic Corridors, Devin Dreeshen, joining us now to talk more about uh, what is happening. Uh, Minister, great to see you as always. Thank you for joining us. Always happy to be on your show, Bruce. Thank you for the invite. Hey, a big announcement this week, uh, transforming the future of commercial driving here in Alberta. Uh, what changes are you making and what kind of impact will it have for Albertans? So Alberta is actually being a leader across the country when it comes to reforms in our class one licensing. So that's the, the big semi trucks that you see on the highways. We are now implementing not just pre-licensed training where uh, anyone wanting to become a truck driver has to take 121 hours of training on a truck that you'll never see before. And then they're just out into the trucking industry, whether it's a, a large commercial carrier or a smaller private carrier, and uh, they have to kind of learn as they go. So we want to make sure that there is more appropriate training for truck drivers in vehicles that they're actually going to be driving after they acquire a license. So it was a big transformational change that we announced here today. And, and we think other provinces and other jurisdictions are going to, to follow suit. As well, Budget 24 actually has $41 million of uh, additional grant funding for on-the-job training in vehicles that new drivers will be, will be driving. So it was a, a big change here today and also helping to address the nearly 4,000 uh, truck driver shortage that we have here in the province. So uh, a good if, if you need anything by truck, which we all do on our daily lives, it was a really, really big announcement here in Alberta. I'm always reminded of the saying, if you got it, a truck brought it, right, is uh, is one of the things you always hear. Hey, you mentioned the budget minister and included nearly $2 billion uh, for planning, design, and construction of major highway and bridge projects. Uh, let's talk about these projects. What what can Albertans uh, expect to see in the year ahead? So, so we have 64,000 lane kilometers that the province owns here in Alberta. We have nearly 5,000 bridges. And uh, that, that money will go a long way to, to expanding them, to making them better and also improving them. But some really big ticketed items uh, is the twinning of Highway 3 down in Southern Alberta, which essentially goes from Medicine Hat to the, the BC border, as well as Highway 40 um, near Grand Prairie, which essentially will make a, a ring road to the Southwest of Grand Prairie, diverting big heavy truck traffic away from the downtown core of Grand Prairie, uh, where it should be on, on the outskirts as well as in Edmonton and Calgary, Twilliger Drive in the southwest part of Edmonton, as well as Deerfoot Trail, seeing hundreds of millions of dollars of improvements to, to widen and add more lanes and improve uh, that area of, of Calgary in the, in the south. So there's some, some big ticket items that are gonna be in lots of construction this year as we're getting close to construction season. So I just encourage all Albertans to, to be patient because uh, they're really gonna like the, the outcome when, when these projects are finally completed. Can you give us any uh, any insight into future projects? Anything that's planned in the hopper that you're you're able to talk about? And I, I don't know, Minister, if I'm overstepping, if you're even allowed to uh, to give us any insight into that. But it, it's you know you're curious to know what what might be coming. Well, some some really big, interesting projects that uh, got the support of cabinet and caucus 
on a, a resource revenue map, which essentially looks at the, the $18 billion that Alberta brings in when it comes to oil and gas royalties. Where does it actually come from? And trying to make sure that the, the roads and the bridges out in rural Alberta, especially in northern Alberta, has, has the infrastructure, has the road network built out so that we can see more investments and more trucks on those roads, because essentially that's, that's what pays the bills. And we want to make sure that our infrastructure in rural Alberta is built out so we can, we can grow that $18 billion number. Look, as we're talking about roads and bridges, let's end with this today. I know you had a very meaningful announcement uh, this week and, um, uh, you know, you help you, you named a couple of bridges after a couple of, of fallen uh, fallen officers, and they were uh, constables Travis Jordan and constables Brett Ryan. Uh, speak to that minister, and I guess uh, uh, how it felt to be able to do that. So it was it was very heartfelt. I'm I'm sure many Albertans and Canadians saw the memorial service that happened last year for Constable Travis Jordan and, and Constable Brett Ryan. Uh, two Edmonton police officers that were killed in the line of duty, and to to be to be at the Edmonton police headquarters with the families to talk about how there are two bridges, two twin bridges, uh, going over the North Saskatchewan River on the Anthony Hende, the, the ring road around Edmonton. That uh, both of those bridges will will be named after those those two officers, and uh, it was something that it was. It was, it was very heartfelt and very meaningful. And I do hope that Edmontonians and, and everyone crossing those bridges knows the, the courage and the sacrifice that those two brave police officers, those two brave heroes did uh, to serve the people of Edmonton. And uh, I hope it's uh, something that that uh, will never be forgotten because their courage That's and their names never will be. That's uh, exactly the, the, the way to put it, Minister, never to be forgotten. Um, so good on you. Uh, listen, thanks for doing this as always. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Bruce. Take care. All right, Min Minister of Transportation and Economic Corridors, Devin Drieschen, joining us. Alberta's government is making significant investments to ensure more Albertans receive the surgeries that they need with clinically recommended wait times. Uh, the province is on track to complete more surgeries this year than ever before. Minister of Health Adrienne Lagrange saying that if passed, Budget 2024 would invest $608 million in targeted spending to ensure more Albertans get the procedures they need when and where they need them. The Alberta Surgical Initiative focuses on improving every patient's surgical journey from the moment they seek initial advice to when they are referred to a specialist to their surgery and rehabilitation period. It recognizes the need to put patients first and to manage capacity and to do whatever we can to ensure Albertans receive required surgeries within clinically recommended wait times. $305 million will be invested to performing surgeries this year, while $313 million over the next three years will help add and expand operating rooms across the province. Minister of Environment and Protected Areas Rebecca Schultz joining Minister of Forestry and Parks Todd Lowen to highlight the vital role that Alberta's, for Alberta's forests play uh, in our province this week. Here's a look at what they had to say. Let's celebrate and talk about the importance of thriving and healthy forests right across our province. As a province, we have the largest continuous area of boreal protected forest in the world. Our amazing forests are an unmatched landscape of towering trees, vibrant foliage, and diverse wildlife enjoyed by so many Albertans since the beginning of our long history. But that's not all. Our forests are also vital for the wildlife who also call Alberta home. Over a million new trees every year are planted in Alberta, which creates new habitats and vegetation to help wildlife grow and thrive. So far, over 1,000 kilometers of abandoned seismic lines have been replanted and restored in caribou ranges. Albertans are proud to live in a province of endless natural beauty, and we will continue protecting our forests for generations to come. That's absolutely right, Minister Schultz. Alberta's forests give Albertans many opportunities to enjoy diverse outdoor activities like winter camping, comfort camping, and glamping. Albertans also want opportunities for high quality fishing and hunting. Protecting Alberta's treasured forests also means ensuring we take action to prepare for wildfire season. I want to remind Albertans that wildfire prevention is a shared responsibility and every Albertan can do their part to protect our forests and communities from the impacts of wildfire in the months and years to come. Please stay diligent and report any fires you see on the landscape by calling 310-FIRE. 
Albertans should also familiarize themselves with the FireSmart principles and encourage your community to seek information about our FireGuard program. Together, we will maintain and protect Alberta's precious forests and landscapes. With the risk of drought facing the province, Alberta's government is investing in new projects to address water supply concerns. Alberta Innovates has invested more than $75 million through its water innovation program, supporting 101 completed projects with 65 more still in the works. Uh, Mark Summers, the Associate Vice President at Alberta Innovates, says the support of the Alberta government is key to developing new ways to manage water for generations to come. The water innovation program that here we're here talking about today advances the technologies, tools, and knowledge to ensure Alberta has a safe, secure, and reliable water supply so our communities, businesses, farms, and ecosystems have the water they need now and into the future. Reservoirs also play a vital role in irrigation, drought management, water security, and in flood protection. In addition to technology and innovation to fight droughts, the Alberta government is looking into the feasibility of a new dam and reservoir on the Bow River downstream of the Bassano Dam in uh, southern Alberta. Uh, the goal of these projects is to help ensure that all Albertans have a safe and a reliable water supply. Alberta's government is investing in revitalizing downtown Calgary, and we talked a little bit about this on uh, last week's Alberta Update. Calgary, we know, has a thriving arts and culture scene, which significantly, significantly contributes to our province's economy and helps make it a destination to choice for people looking to move to Alberta. Minister of Arts, Culture and the Status of Women, Tanya Fur, recently announcing a project which will transform Arts Commons and Olympic Plaza. Hello, I'm Tanya Fur, Alberta's Minister of Arts, Culture and Status of Women. And I'm Alex Sarian, President and CEO here at Arts Commons. I'm so excited to share with you that Alberta's government is investing $103 million over the next seven years in the Arts, Commons and Olympic Plaza Transformation Project. This is one of the largest capital investments in the arts Alberta's government has ever made and demonstrates our commitment to supporting the arts for all Albertans now and for generations to come. Our mission at Arts Commons is to continue to support a thriving arts sector where Albertans from all backgrounds can enjoy the arts within our facility. Let us celebrate this impactful investment and continue to champion the arts as a cornerstone of our identity and our future. Together, we can continue to build a brighter, more vibrant Alberta. Again, the minister joining us on the program last week uh, to hint at that announcement, which was to come uh, just the next day. Uh, great news for the arts community in Calgary. Well, that does it uh, for this week's Alberta Update. A look at what's happening in your province uh, with your government. And uh, we always appreciate you uh, you tuning in. Remember to subscribe by going to uh, going to YouTube. Sorry, going to, um, yes, go to YouTube, subscribe to the Alberta Update, share it with your friends and your family. And uh, happy Easter to those of you celebrating this weekend have the uh, have the best of weekends uh, we'll be taking a week off as the the MLAs and ministers break for it and stit break but we'll be back in a couple of weeks time with the next Alberta update until then thanks for being with us so long